Welcome to our new show here on 2 Mickey FM called My Vote, a program to inform you so that you can use your vote in a thoughtful and empowered way. Caught there here at Vote. Ah, oh, I hear you ask that. Well, Farno, you are being asked to elect your local government. They will be the people to oversee the services you receive from District Council, Regional Council and the DHB for the next three years. It is therefore ma in the best interests of you, your whānau, hapu and iwi to have the right people at the table, people who represent your values, your whakaro and your perspective because you know whānau, there are those who don't represent you and there are those who do. So that's what the show is about, about your empowered vote and we have two amazing wahine tōa here with us today. Uh, oh, tuatahi, ko tōi kai rākou, tōku ingoa, I'm your host for the show. And this morning, uh, yes, we have two wahine tōa, both standing for Mayor of the Whakatane District. Tuatahi, Judy Turner, is the current Deputy Mayor, and she's been sitting in, a council, in the Council Chair for some years now, as well as for the DHB. And in this election, she's gone all in. It's Mayor or nothing. <laughs> Kia ora Judy, welcome Kia ora. to the show. Kia ora. Uh, kei konei hoki, uh, i tēnei ata, ko Leslie Emick, mai tūwhare toa, Ngāti Apa me Ngāti Porau. Right. She is a, a successful businesswoman who was brought up in Kaurau and has lived in Whakatane for 30 years. She's gunning for the mayor as well as councillor of Whakatane o Hope Ward. Ata Maria Leslie. Oh, kia ora tātou. Mm. Tēnā kōrua, no mai, no mai. Hey, so let's just jump straight into this. What are you fellas going to do for Māori? Let's start with you, Judy. Well, I think um, the, I've got two things that uh, currently concern me. One is that the um, Māori voice has not been well represented at the council table, and I'm really hoping that this election throws up a change in that, in that space, that we do have Māori representation. If we don't, we have to find another way of doing it. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware, for instance, on our Audit and Risk Committee uh, that we have two independent members of that with voting rights on that committee. Um, and most councils now with their Audit and Risk Committees have independent, usually um, auditors or accountants of some kind that can bring that eye over our auditing processes. So my thinking is let's look at our other committees and say, and particularly around policy, in particular is the one that strikes me as where we would, I would really value a Māori perspective uh, should we have people come onto that committee um, and uh, with voting rights on that committee um, to bring a Māori voice to the table? My first option is that we get Māori elected. Um, I think that's a much more substantial position and that gives them a lot more power and say in, in terms of the direction of council. Um, but how do we, if failing that, how else do we hear the Māori voice at the table? Sure, sure, I hear that, Judy. Leslie, what are your thoughts? Uh, well, first of all, I am Māori and I'm proud to be Māori. And I think for a community that has nearly 50% of our community members being Māori, we need to be doing a lot more in the, the chamber and outside in the community. And Otorua, a couple of years ago, went bilingual. And for me, I can absolutely see that that's a realistic goal that we should be able to achieve across our district and in our community. Um, in terms of the policy... Everything seems to have an economic focus, but they don't have that kaitiakitanga, the sustainability, and the manakitanga, the overview of well-being of the people and the environment. And this is what is inherently Māori. They don't have to learn how to do all these things. They just are. So we need to, to learn and listen and implement right across all of our policy settings and within the culture within council, um, much more of a Māori lens. And... Even though I am not new to being Māori, we didn't know we were Māori growing up, but we've definitely embraced it and I've done everything I can in my professional life to encourage and educate others to do learn more. You know, there's a paradigm shift happening now and it's Māori's time and it's the community's time to fully embrace it. So I'm pretty excited about the next few years. Kia yeah. ora. Uh, touch on a couple of things there. Uh, firstly... We know Māori are disengaged as, as voters in this process. Uh, what are your thoughts ab around why that is and, and what are we going to do, it, do about it? Is it because we just turn up as well as, as candidates, you turn up every three years and uh, 
come and talk to the community and then other than that the engagement isn't there they don't seem to see local government as something that includes them or or is important to their lives w- what do you say about that I think people are largely unaware of all the things that their lives rely, rely on. And I think, I, I we remember the Christchurch earthquake when so much damage was done to infrastructure within the community. And I think at that point people suddenly realised how much they relied on local government to provide for their basic needs. So in terms of um, Māori voice, I, I think the first thing is elected people have to be more engaged during the, the whole triennium um, with all the community, and that includes, of course, um, iwi. Um, iwi are a major contributor to our economic uh, growth, uh, Ngāti Awa, Tūhoi, Naitahu. Um, everywhere around our district I see iwi stepping up uh, for their people for a start off, but uh, looking at the resources they have, and particularly for those for whom settlement has happened, that's the beginning of, of a whole new way of progressing their future. It's pretty impressive in my books. And actually they're the only investment in this community we can completely depend upon uh, because they're not going anywhere. Uh, they're here for the long haul. And, and failing to understand that is a huge mistake for central government, local government, regional council. Everybody's got to be aware of the value that Māori bring. Um, this is not about let's do something for Māori. It's actually understanding that what they are doing for the community already that we need to be uh, supporting and partnering with them. Sceptical of me uh, to think that, well, hey, the iwi are cashed up now. Now the district councils want to come knocking on the door and having a relationship and there would be that sceptic- uh, you know, that scepticism amongst the I- amongst the iwi. Totally right. They've been paid tokenism notice over the years and now that iwi and hapu have received their settlements and they're coming in to be an economic power player, I think uh, community councils across the country as well as the government are finally sitting up and taking notice. Um, but for those that have not shown true respect to Māori, it could be they they should be very careful and cautious because Māori have long memories and deservedly so. Going back to your question about trying to engage with young Māori people, I think if we can, as a community, show respect to all Māori first and the culture and all the tika kanga that surrounds it, it actually goes a long way to understanding. Um, who's inside your community. Like, for example, we've actually got quite a high Dutch community here and there's probably more people that understand a bit more Dutch culture than Māori culture, which is ironic considering we're such a highly populated Māori community, very similar to Kawaro. So to get young Māori people engaged, we've got to actually go back to the basics of the history of New Zealand. So okay, to pie with the announcement that's just come in um, today about teaching history in, um, in New Zealand in secondary schools, but also civics education. And Māori already have their own political system, you know, within their hapū and their iwi. So maybe it's a dual education process of civics education, including local government elections, as well as what happens in the um, the Māori tree of decision-making. Because, Judy, I, I actually emceed the New Zealand Planners Association conference down in Napier earlier this year. And one thing, it was the first time that they had ever had a Māori MC. And as an association and as a sector, planners are starting to look towards Mātauranga Māori, not just as a, uh, a, a, a pretty thing to layer on top to uh, make their strategies and long-term plans look nice and, and say that they've ticked the, the consultation box, but actually real practical uh, ways to approach some of the issues that we're dealing with. How, in the last... Uh, couple of terms has, because you've been there for the last couple of terms, has Whakatane District gone about actually taking that mātauranga Māori and layering it into the uh, terms of reference and the policy framework within District Council so that planners can base decisions around mātauranga Māori and Māori concepts? See, the obligation and requirement to do that is actually enshrined in the Resource Management Act, which is, of course, what planners, uh, it's their Bible. Um, and it's been there for quite some years. So our district plan, which I personally was somebody that worked on, we there was nothing that we could do of significance that didn't involve some form of Māori consultation with the iwi affected by whatever we were looking at doing. Now, that's, that's been enshrined in law and a mandated um, thing that we had to do for years. Um, and so we've had some very good engagement um, through that, through the development of that um, that plan, um, I'm always quite inspired by Tuhoi, who um, 
are very, I, I think the standard they set for themselves is higher than the standard that's required in the Resource Management Act and they're not even asking government or council to actually do much about it other than let them get on with the job. Um, and so it, it, iwi by iwi the the, requ- the expectations are slightly different has been my experience in, and in Tuhoi's case for instance they sort of saying you know uh, we're kind of keen to do this on our own and be independent and, and supply our own re- uh, infrastructure and do our own thing as we further develop villages and the like within our rohi and um, there, there's actually an opportunity there isn't, isn't yeah. there where there could be shared uh, cost sharing when it comes to actually building yes. some of this infrastructure like water, potable water and um, reticulating systems and so forth. Yes. Um, but they would, I would say, also look at wanting a co-management or actually more, uh, yes. which which is difficult for district councils because that's... They, well, I think the, the tricky thing for us as district councils is that we are answerable further up the food chain ourselves. You know, I think people don't realise that, that district councils are almost the bottom of the regulatory food chain, and we have to give effect to uh, regional policy statements, national policy statements, uh, and we are less masters of our own fate than people think we are. I mean, we have some discretion, but not as much as people think. So, for instance, you take something like the standard for water, which has just gone up, and we are looking quite strongly towards probably a national uh, water quality regulator for drinking water standards, which I think is a good thing. So my con- my thinking, it's not a concern, it's just a how are we going to help support Tuhoi if they set up their own drinking water system for their, their own development? Ultimately, the district council is responsible. Yes, we are. Statutorily and, yes, responsible. But those all those water systems will need to be regularly tested and, and results sent to the um, regulator and they will have to meet meet those standards as well. Now, how can we help with that? Um, do you want us in that space, or do you want to just be answerable to the regulator directly yourself? Um, is there anything that we do that we would be more cost effective if we did it together? Um, or, or, and what those are those things you want to do on your own? I'm perfectly open to that. I just want to to make clear that the standard is not going to be set by us; it's going to be set by Wellington. And so, how can we help you meet that standard? And and it may take a journey. It may be over a period of time that if if, if, the, if the ultimate goal is to be independent of council even, that that we need to do that by degree so that it's affordable for Tuhui to step up into that space. But in my discussions with them today, I have been very impressed that in many ways the bar they have set for themselves is higher than the, probably could even be higher than the bar that's set nationally. Yeah, we take ourselves pretty seriously. Only I think it's great. <laughs> uh, Leslie, do you have any ideas around, uh, around how we manage, how council manages those relationships and the potential around co-sharing costs as well as management of, of of essential infrastructure within areas that tribes uh, are located. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think um, Iwi have actually got a number of the solutions themselves, and most indigenous cultures around the world do. And it seems like you know the more aged European culture is getting, and the more consumerism, you know, that we're doing. Um, we're now going back into the whole Mother Earth circle of only taking what you need and being sustainable going forward. So we can actually learn from Māori rather than um, add them to the side and ask them for their advice. Let's look at that whole holistic way that, that they want to live. And it doesn't mean that it has to be an either or all or a right or wrong way. It can actually be an and for this particular choice for people and it can be an and for this group. But from a shared infrastructure point of view, we absolutely have to get smarter. We have to use the, <coughs> excuse me, the technology and we have to use the, the cultural learnings of how to bring the best out of Papatuanuku because we really have bastardised and consumed it at a phenomenal rate. And our probably local community is not as bad as obviously other places around the country and in the world. Because how do you match that? This is the question. Because... People want jobs. Mm. They want affordable housing. They want economic development. I, I personally don't believe that economic development is synonymous with economic growth necessarily because when we're looking at balancing uh, the financial pressures that we find ourselves under to afford things and the environmental impact of our industrial activities, you've touched on that. Is, is it a mindset shift and how what role does district council play in that because as, as candidates I've noticed at the candidate meetings um, they come and say that they're going to fix everything <laughs> but some of these are actually competing 
forces. So you can't really have one without affecting the other. I think we need to define our purpose first. And I was lucky enough to attend a fantastic conference where Shay Wright, a young, young, gung Māori entrepreneur with a huge social conscience, and he says whether you're running a, a business of building tables or you're running an organisation, define your purpose first and inspire everyone else to get on board with the purpose. And then you will work out how the money works after that. Because in Western world, what we do is we work hard to make money and then if we make a little bit of money, we give philanthropically and we pat ourselves on the back for it. But we need to completely inverse the way that we think about things. And for me, like coming for Mayor, running for Mayor, I, I want us to define our purpose, which is the health and well-being of the people and the environment. And if that's our first purpose, surely we're smart enough to work out how the economics of that can, can yeah, afford it. The latest figures I've read around the Māori economy is that it's actually um, doing extremely well. I think, you know, I, I think we've got to keep perspective here. I think that to date, what's been achieved has been quite remarkable. And so you, you talk about what's council's role. Well, I think the first role is actually maintaining relationships and understanding that relationships are not developed and maintained with Māori by sending emails. It is face-to-face and on a regular basis. And it's actually... Uh, beyond the task of the moment. It's actually beyond any piece of your agenda. It's actually to have an ongoing relationship that's meaningful and is is genuinely two-way. But don't you Um, think, Judy, you know, the council's had the last three or four terms to be able to do that. I mean, this is a community in New Zealand that's highly multi-populated and, you know, we should have been New Zealand leading in iwi and council relations and really my observation is that we've actually just been having them on the sides and really until Ngāti Awa purchased White Island Tours, it's kind of really just been all on the fringes. I mean, the, the iwi liaison committee, we don't get any sort of feedback about what's happening there as well. well we don't have an iwi liaison committee because what was what by what iwi asked us for was what we do now have, which is where the, the mayor and the chief executive have regular meetings with the runangas mm-hmm. um, together and collectively. That was their request. They want, they felt that it wasn't what was happening wasn't meaningful. And actually, I would counter that, Leslie. I think that in the the last nine years since I've been on, and I give some credit here to Tony Bond, our current mayor, he has front-footed it and made sure that he has uh, done his very best. And, and of course, I think there was a bit of suspicion initially, like, what, what, are, you, what are you really wanting here? Is, an, is there a secret agenda going on? But I think he's pushed through, and, and um, certainly with um, the iwi chairs and uh, the Runanga chairs, there's, there's been some really good engagement. Um, and and our, really our attitude is what can we do what, what, what can we do that is assisting um, your intentions for your people uh, with the assets that you've now got and the asset that you're growing substantially? What can we do to help? Um, I, say, if, if what you say is true, why do local Māori feel so disconnected? from council and decisions and policy making. We need to make a distinction there. Mm. There is iwi engagement yes. and then there's constituent engagement yes. and a lot of Māori aren't that engaged with the iwi and the hierarchy within iwi and so we need to be very clear about that because where we feature most highly on uh, the, the statistics around uh, homelessness uh, poverty, education, all of these things that we have here in our community, these are the Māori who are least connected with the iwi. That would be my uh, observation as well. And um, and so we, I think we need to, to, to together, particularly where we're dealing with people who, we're with high deprivation and complex needs, that where it's not it's, there's no one organisational group that can can make the difference on their own. It's actually going to have to be a combined effort. And and my observation, I think things like social sector trials and some of those things have been one of their advantages is you've got government departments dealing with the same people with the same issues, finally talking to each other. And so instead of having the same people having to deal with multiple agencies, there was a bit of collaboration. And I'm not sure how, how well that's been sustained since those trials were, were have been left uh, um, gone away, but I, I do think that um, I think that um, we, when the two groups that are most disengaged politically are youth and and Maori, and in both those cases, you know, we, we we have to be thinking about succession planning going forward as a community. And I have a big concern right now that we are not developing properly 
um, a growth of of leadership amongst young people. We've got a, a youth council that's, I think, made some progress in that regard, but we need to say, how could we do that better? We need to listen to their voices. I think they've got some good ideas themselves about that. We've, I think for a while it got into a stage where youth, the youth council just ran some youth events. Now, you know, learning how to run an event's a skill, so you know, it's not a complete waste of time, but how much more could we be developing? Yep. As council, you're quite often uh, having to make a choice between uh, a not so great outcome and an even worse outcome. They're very difficult decisions, and that's the reality of being in leadership and and entering youth into the realities that it's not all just like running events and hey yay let's get out and vote. That actually you're dealing with very complex issues that are um, are going to be uh, that are, the outcomes are going to be long term, and they might actually take a while to to see those outcomes. I think this is so urgent. I remember when the Christchurch um, event happened at the mosque. Uh, I got a ring from my son. He said, turn on TV One. I turned it on. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. And everybody, all the people that were being interviewed were saying, oh, my gosh, fancy this happening in New Zealand. After a while, the stories got a bit repetitive, so I flicked over to TV Three. And they were interviewing a guy who was a security analyst and Paul Buchanan was his name, and he had a very different message. And he was saying, "Well, I'm not at all surprised. This is this has been brewing for years here in New Zealand." We, we and he said there were two things that we were not attending to. One was we had not taken white supremacist groups seriously enough as as, as a risk, which they flip and have been for a long time. But the second thing he talked about was our conversations with each other as a community on social media and how feral they are and how, how we need to start to look at those conversations. And, it, and I've actually, I, it, may, it was like a slap around the face for me as I thought about the, the kind of, as counsellors, we kind of get often just really feral comments back. You try and engage through social media because that's we, the platform that we're told everybody's on. So I've changed my approach to to social media a lot now. And when I put up stuff, if I, you know, you get that, oh, you're an idiot, you don't know what you're doing, that kind of comments come back at you. I go back and I ask people questions. Now, I have a funny feeling they don't know the answers to those questions. But what I'm trying to do is, don't react. Think about it. If you are concerned, if you don't like what I'm doing, if you don't like what I'm saying, explain to me what it is that I'm missing. What's the piece of the jigsaw that you've got in your hand that I haven't got in my hand and you want me to have? Don't just tell me that I'm an idiot. Tell me why I'm an idiot and, and, and then I can do something about that. But we need to start the discussions and we need to be careful that on social media that we do not let other people set the tone for our contribution because we may be responding to one person, but you've got an audience audience of hundreds watching this feral discussion go on between where you just abuse each other back and forward. I think that if we're going to engage with the disengaged, the currently disengaged, we need to understand that we need to put much more meaningful connection to them than just random it's comments. For, it's a generational thing. Yeah, it is. A uh, I know there's some councillors who don't have any social media presence, yet that is actually where largely the constituency is consuming their information. They are discovering their news, discovering the issues and cope up of the day via social media. And if you aren't savvy with that and if you're unable to communicate via that medium, then then what are you doing in the race? Are you but also I think sometimes councillors get really discouraged because if you if, if you just get attacked every time you try and make a comment, then you give up. You just it's too hurtful. I and there's some great young Maori um like young Taylor Bryant, you know, with from the Future Leaders Group, she's doing a really fantastic job of galvanising young people to vote, and um, through the Future Leaders program that they've got, you know, they are using social media to get that message out, and you can use social media in a very effective way, and you've got to just like when someone gives you a comment on the street that you don't agree with or it wasn't warranted, you just let that sort of stuff bounce. So you can use social media very similar to your everyday engagement with people. Sure. Yeah, but we, we have got some, this, there's a paradigm shift happening, and I, I hope we ex get some good results this year with the local bodily elections. You know, we've got myself who's Māori, we've got Pauro Tongarupo's Māori, we've got Hinalangi Goodman who's Māori. That's three Māori people putting their hand up for yeah. mayor. And then we've got a whole... And also you've got four women out of the seven putting their yes, hand up for me, and that, yes. in terms of diversity, Good on is us amazing. Girls, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then we've got this whole um, strewn of people putting their hands up for community boards and for a uh, councillor. We, we, don't we want to see... Uh, 
we don't want to see career politicians in these in these chairs. We want to see people who care about their community, who have the, the various skill bases as well. Because that's the thing: you don't want all of the same skill base. You need diversity in in, in those spaces. And I think it's interesting. I have to give big ups to Judy and Tony um, for leading the Maori seats um, last year. And it was a real shame we didn't get it across the no, board. Yeah. We really should have been one of the few out of the five um, councils that were running it with the highest Māori population. We should have really got it across the board, and it's a real shame. So, Judy, what do you reckon? Like, how well, hard I, did the team try? Oh, look, I, in fact, I wonder, you know, I had numbers of meetings with Māori um, about... Um, getting people on the roll to vote in the referendum, um, those types of practical things that were going to make make a difference. Um, we um, and and they worked really really hard. And and so people like myself, we I kind of focused on Pakeha attitudes um, for the for the referendum. Um, and the, the people who I were dealing with who were Maori were actually out there working with their own people, getting them on the roll, making sure that they understood how important this was for them to vote and what a difference it was going to make going forward. I, I mean, I found with 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 non non Maori, um, you know, I kept saying to people, well, why do we have wars anyway? What, you know, if we just elected everybody at large, what would happen then? And what, of course, what would happen is because the greater population bases in the Fokotani Hopi, exactly. And so, because rural people want to know there's somebody at the table that understands them and the types of challenges they face when they're more isolated, uh, you want to vote for that. That's exactly the same argument for Māori wards. It's actually somebody who gets them and, and represents their worldview and the issues they have. It's it's common sense. And this does segue actually into, into my, my next question which came up at Matata about the feeling that Ohope and Whakatane get more resources and more services than the other towns. Now it does come down to that you have more councillors around the table represented from these wards because that's where the population base is but you know I know out in Tani Atua, uh, they mow the park there and they don't use a catcher and it looks terrible. You've got piles of grass all around and the kids go around and play and then they run that grass out into their cars and uh, you don't see that happen uh, in Whakatane. In my training to be you know, mayor and councillor, I've been attending all the community board meetings as well as the council meetings. And there is a real sense amongst the community board members that there's some frustration about the haves and the have-nots. And I just want to use an analogy of, I guess, Whakatane or Hopi is like your house, you know, and our regions of Murupara and Matata and Taniata and Waimana, they're kind of like the garden, you know, that that makes the house look really good or that adds a lot more value. Well, Whakatane Hopi looks after itself, but they're actually really forgetting about the whole rest of the garden. And if the garden and the driveway um, are not mowed, you know, or tended to, it actually does impact on the overall experience that everybody has when they come. Like if our gateway entrances into the into Whakatane Hopi, if they're not beautiful, they don't even have their own signs. Matata has a welcome to Whakatane sign, not a welcome to Matata. So I can see that there's some really small, subtle changes that can be made by council to actually beautify and enhance um, just not the, the serve just not the physical look, but the services within the communities as well. Because the, the reality is, some of these towns, I mean, I just think of Mutapara, and it seems like it's a case of out of mind, out of sight, out of mind, because they are, they are further away, but they are also in a state where they need so much more investment. I think we were talking about this earlier as well, Judy, about if, if, you're, ta- if you're using targeted rates to try to build infrastructure in those specific towns areas that those areas cannot afford it so you have to spread the load amongst everybody every community believes they are subsidizing every other community if i if i had one message and that the the, that's actually a a kind of a ridiculous assumption so we have for instance let me tell you we have in matata 333 households that pay rates whereas in ohopi for instance we have 1880 rate payers who, who are contributing. Now, of course, you want to share it across the district, but we also have to understand that the Fokotani CBD kind of township area is a bit of a halo, not just for Fokotani district, but for the whole Eastern Bay of Plenty. You talk to people in, in Kauria when they want to go out for dinner, they come to Fokotani to take their guests out for dinner somewhere to a restaurant. So we have a halo effect across the whole Eastern Bay. And when we were starting to look at the Provincial Growth Fund um, and we worked together um, as councils, with regional council and with 
iwi around those applications, um, it was understood that, for instance, there are some amazing, at Lake Mirapara, some fantastic tourism opportunities happening up there already, busloads of people going up to um, operators up there that are doing some amazing work. And But we all understand, every tourist op- tourism operator understands that the, the anchor, the hook, is White Island, that people come from around the world for that. That's the one they know about. The next thing is how do we get them to stay for two or three days and halo them out into all the other amazing opportunities? Because we do know some things about from the tourism board. We do know why people come to Fokotani. They come for White Island. They want authentic cultural experiences. They are very people who come here tend to be focused on the natural environment. They want bushwalks. They want um, water, good water quality. They are usually quite active people, um, and so therefore the things that are on offer further in the hinterland of our district are just as much um, the types of things these people are looking for. You know, I've, got, I've got to jump in there because Whakatane Council missed a huge opportunity out at Murupara. You know, I, I work with Māori tur- tourism operators on start-up businesses and there's a fantastic initiative going out there um, for fit, with Whitanaki experiences. So they want to create a Milford track out there in Whitanaki Park. So three days, two nights and beautiful glamping on suites for the first night and gorgeous designed Whare Moi the second night. So this is a multi-day guided walk. There are no multi-day guided walks in the North Island with private accommodation. Now, that, that, that um, business came to present it to the district council, to the economic development people, and they said, oh, that's very interesting. They said they wanted to put in a PGF application. There was not been one single piece of communication come from the district council back to that operator who wants to create viable, long-term, full-time employment for people of Murupara. And yes, they have put their own one in, but what I'm talking about is that look at our marine precinct and the whole focus that has come around that, there are other opportunities happening in the wider district that the council is just putting on the let's wait and see. You're saying it's too focused in Whakatane. Because the PGF, and I just want to touch, we've only got a couple of minutes left, just wanted to touch on quickly the the PGF funding for the CBD. The criticism that I've heard is that our CBD could be underwater and if projections are correct, it's not looking like it's to, um, in terms of a long-term plan, doing that down there. What, what do you say to that, Judy? Well, my understanding is that the regional council of who manage the soft banks, etc., are very aware of, of those types of issues with the river and sea level rises, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and so that's going to be a focus of their attention, um, and that um, the CBD is, is, is not... Um, an immediate concern in that regard. So we, the only, the only reason that it became the thing is that, that is that all the, I think the sixty, nearly seventy applications from the Eastern Bay of Plenty to the uh, PGF, and we are aware of all of them. The ones that council has the most control over is obviously the ones that involve assets that we own or are managing directly. Um, the experts from Ministry of Business and Innovation across the whole Eastern Bay, not just our council, identified four major projects. One was the aquaculture and their needs there. One was the uh, industrial symbiosis out at Kaurau. One was tourism starting in the Whakatane as the halo effect. Um, And they certainly looked at the other projects. But the ones that we have the most direct influence over are ones that require on the assets that we have ownership for. And they saw that the marine precinct was a, a hugely important part of developing that to the next level. And they suggested, um, MB said, you know, have you thought of reorientating your town back towards the river? Well, of course we have, but how do we do that? Well, why don't you put some uh, starting, but of starting money, apply for, for that in the fund? So we're like, oh, that sounds like a pretty good idea. All right. So we've started to develop that around the guidance from Ministry of Business and Innovation, um, using the assets that we actually own. That doesn't mean we aren't supportive of Every other application that goes into that, of course we are, but we don't only any own any assets personally as a council that we can contribute towards that. That doesn't. That's not a lack of of interest and support. It's just being realistic about what we can affect. Are you supportive, Leslie, of of the PGF uh, funding that's coming in around the CBD as well as the marina? Look, I don't want to shock tourism centric people, but I actually really think our infrastructures are got a much higher priority. But I do accept that the PGF application did not allow for infrastructure um, projects to be funded for. It had to be economic de- development and employment creation. And um, 
So, but I am concerned that we are going to be overextending ourselves. We've already extended our, our loan debt from 76 million out to 139 million, and a propor- fair proportion of that is for the Three Waters infrastructure. If we do get additional subsidised funding from the government for our new marine precinct and the re- harbour redevelopment, this is going to be a real catch-22 for the Fakatani district and the ratepayers, but we do have to recruit some private investment as well. So I haven't seen the right evidence to suggest to me we have the skill set to have it all. OK, Kapo, ladies, we are going to have to leave it there. That was a good court at all. You feel like you got some stuff out? That's right. The, the, we are talking about partnerships and relationships. Tēnā kōrua. Uh, that was Judy Turner and Leslie Emick here uh, on My Vote. This is a show where we're looking to inform you, Fano, so that you have uh, a, a way to make a, an informed and an empowered vote and using your vote of uh, for wisely, your vote and your Fano's vote. Voting papers are going to be arriving in your mailbox in the next couple of weeks. That is uh, between the 20th and the 25th of September. We are going to be doing this show twice a week up until that point or a little bit afterwards, Sue, because you've got a month to vote. So you don't have to have those voting papers back to October the 12th. Uh, so every Tuesday and Thursday over the next few weeks, Farno, you'll be able to uh, catch up with myself, Toi Kairakawitsi, and the various candidates who are vying for your vote. Uh, koe nā te kaupapa mō tēnei ata, kia pai tō rā, uh, kā kōrero tātou, ākua nei, nō mai.